I'm recording. Okay. Okay. I'm yep. recording. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this uh, one-off interview, exclusive interview with the wonderful Paulette Randall in celebration of Clean Breaks Black History Month. Uh, I'm going to be your host today. My name is Demi. I am the Development and Members Assistant at Clean Break, and I have the honour of interviewing the wonderful Paulette Randall. Hi, Paulette. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are so welcome. Hi. Thank you. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I actually watched a TED Talk with you, Paula, and you described yourself as the most famous writer, director, Jamaican-British woman playwright that you've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully our audience know who you are all of these years later. Um, but Paula is a director and writer who has worked extensively in theatre, film and television. She is one of the most influential people in theatre, having directed at many of England's leading theatres. He's the former artistic director of Talawa Theatre Company and was the first ever black female director to bring a production to the West End in 2013, which is just madness, <laughs> um, but also an incredible achievement. Uh, she was a I have to clear. <laughs> I have to clear that up if that's all right. Yeah, please, go ahead. So really, it's the first to bring a, a dramatic uh, play to the West End because Josette Bushelminga, another black woman, did a musical in the West End before me. Okay, all right. Yeah. So you're, <laughs> you're going to give the props where the props are. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Paula. I mean, that still doesn't attract detract from your incredible achievements, of which I will continue. Okay. Um, <laughs> so she was the Associate Director of the London Olympics opening ceremony alongside Danny Boyle, and she's worked extensively on some of your TV shows, including Hollyoaks and Holby City most recently. So I feel like you're slightly uncomfortable with me ruling off all of those achievements, Paula. No, 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 I'm not uncomfortable. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, as I said, the right people get the right information. Thank you. Thank you so much. And credit You're where welcome. credit's due, which I mean is going to be one of the topics of the conversation is a lack of credit where it's due for right. black uh, people within the arts. Um, yeah. So I guess without further ado, I'd love to just kick off by mm -hmm. asking you about uh, what you're working on at the moment. I know you're working up in Liverpool, if I'm correct. And obviously... Yeah. There is a lot going on in the world at the moment. Uh, it would be great to hear about what you're working on. Well, actually, I'm working on Hollyoaks, as you <laughs> mentioned. Um, yeah. So I've never done it before. Um, and uh, under the current, you know, COVID situation, it, um, it does make filming trickier than it normally would be. But, um, yeah, it's just something different. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So I start shooting next week. Oh, okay. Well, good luck with that. Hollyoaks used Thank to be you. one of my favourite shows when I was a teenager, so you're going to be inspiring another generation. Um, I hope so. To get into the arts. Um, so I guess you're probably then one of the few people who do have the honour of working um, yeah. in the climate at the moment. I mean, how do you feel that... Um, you know, COVID-19 and is going to affect the arts from this point onward. We obviously have um, the government telling us that we should retrain. What are some of your fears um, for the industry post COVID-19 and some of your hopes so that we don't get too bleak? <laughs> I think that um, once we've got used to the idea that this uh, virus is actually going to be here, and it's um, just another one of those things that uh, we have to look after ourselves about and, you know, uh, take care. We'll just get back to normal. I really hope so. I mean, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's definitely kind of turned the world upside down. But I think yeah. one of the beautiful things about the arts is how resilient it is and yeah. that people never stop creating. So I'm quite excited to see... Um, the innovative ways that people just begin to produce a lot of the online stuff. Yeah. I mean, even doing this interview online, it's um, yeah. it gives us, you know, it, digital gives us a lot of space to take up yeah. space. 
Absolutely. And the notion of, you know, retraining, it's so ridiculous because it's kind of saying that this whole industry doesn't have a value. Right. And that's a nonsense because we're talking about our culture, you know, and how does anyone survive without culture? So it's a ridiculous thing to say. It's absolutely and, ridiculous. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw any of the memes that were going around on social media, um, but no. even in the adverts themselves. <laughs> so there's an advert and it says something like, Angelica, she's a ballerina. Angelica could be uh, the next big thing in cyber. And then they break down the ad and say, this was taken by a photographer. This was done by a copywriter. Yeah, yeah. This was done by a graphic designer. There and you go. Even, yeah. even in... Um, the advertising and advocating for retraining they've kind of shot themselves in the foot because we cannot survive without the art yeah, of course not we'll go back then to a time uh, time 30 years ago uh, before COVID-19 um, when we all had big hopes for a brighter future back when you got involved with the clean break I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, how you met um, Jenny and Jackie and how you became um, involved with the organization okay so it was uh 40 years ago and um i was at drama school at uh, what was then rose Bruford college of speech and drama and jenny was um a student in we were in the same year Oh, wow. I didn't know that she went. She ended up going to rose Bruford, which i probably should know don't judge me yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's how we met and so at that point, had she already conceived the idea of the Clean Break Theatre Company or was it something that she was kind of toying with? It, I think it had already started in prison. Well, of yeah. course, it had already started in prison, yeah. which I also know everyone. In yeah. Ascombe Grange in 1979. I know my Clean Break trivia. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, one of the reasons that we've brought uh, you here today is to talk about the play that you wrote for Clean Break, which was 24%. Yeah, and um, for those of you who don't know, um, twenty four percent percent was a play that was examining the systemic racism that shaped the lives of young black women within and beyond the criminal justice system. Um, it was written in nineteen ninety one and presented at the Battersea Art Centre and directed by Bonnie Greer, another extremely impressive black woman. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the process of creating that piece? Um, what was the urgency to write a piece like that at the time? Well, as the title says, 24%, that was the number um, of black women that were, uh, the percentage of black women that were in prison. And you kind of go, look at what we are population-wise. You know, we were probably like one point something percent. So yeah. what is it that suddenly made 24% be incarcerated it doesn't make sense Not it doesn't make sense there's something wrong so it was exploring that how can that number be um and why so it was really examining that and um the research was really um done through Holloway prison and I just spent quite a lot of time there um talking with uh various women and um, yeah, and then it cut, that's really where um, the, the beginnings of it uh, came from. And that was with the help of Clean Break, you know, to get that opportunity to go into uh, Holloway Prison and speak to some incredible women. So I'd just like to ask you, I mean, obviously you have a unique experience as a, as a black woman growing up in London. But when you entered Holloway Prison, um, was there anything there that you discovered that surprised you perhaps of the disparity of uh, of sentencing of black women or did it just kind of reaffirm some of your pre-existing it, beliefs? It just reaffirmed uh, the fears yeah. and you know uh, yeah it just confirmed it it was um, it's one thing reading statistics and it's another thing when you see it um, in the flesh so yeah I mean it was still uh, upsetting and um, yeah it was still upsetting but I think that's the thing with statistics. It's um, you can't quantify human suffering within a number. Twenty-four percent. It you know it may not sound a huge number to people, but that's thousands of women who are wrongly criminalised. And sorry to tell yeah. you, but the numbers today are, are not that much different. Um, really? No, I mean black and mixed ethnicity women are still more than twice as likely to be arrested than white women. 
um, they are also more likely than any other woman to be remanded uh, yeah. to custody. They're 25% more likely to receive a custodial sentence following a uh, conviction. And um, we only account now for 3% of the population. Okay. I mean, when you wrote 24% in 1991, had you, you know, had any thought about why, where we might be 30 years down the line? Oh, God, no. Only that, um, you know, hopefully things would have improved. Yeah. Uh, that's all, you know. I couldn't have thought about, the, I don't know, the next year, let alone the next 30 <laughs> years. But, um, uh, no, you just hope that um, it would certainly bring to attention um, a situation that needed to be rectified um, and changed. But um, it's like, uh, you know, with the Black Lives Matter at the moment, yeah. it's not as if we haven't been saying, and, you know, in America, they haven't been saying for years um, our lives matter. Right. Um, but, you know, it takes, again, a series of uh, awful events that will then make people sit up and um, listen and hopefully bring about the change. But we have to actively be behind making sure that that happens. It's just that awful thing where you feel like, well, I don't know what I can do. What do I, you know, how can I engage with um, making this change? And I think there's all sorts of things, especially now in the time where you were talking about social media, you know, um, mm -hmm. that there are so many now different ways of doing it. But also, you know, there's a bit of you that kind of goes, well, me, I'll say, <laughs> that kind of goes right now, God, maybe it's a, um, you know, it's a young person's uh, game now and um, I will be as supportive as I can be, but I shouldn't be oh. leading. You know, no, because, I mean, I, um, I hate to disagree with you, Paulette. Um, yeah. but I, <laughs> it's not a young person's game. I mean, that's the power of this conversation now. There's power in an intergenerational uh, sure. understanding communication and a, and a shared struggle. Um, sure. And I think that's probably one of the things that struck me the most is uh, in having these discussions with women who are older than myself. Your play was written a little bit before... I was born and yet, you know, we are still facing the same barriers. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah, just to yeah. go off on that actually is that, you know, when you were starting out in theatre as well, mm -hmm. what kind of barriers did you face? And today, I mean, one of the things that has changed is we have huge representation, but you know, a huge improvement in representation of black artistic directors such as Lynette Linton. Mm -hmm. Um, Alexander, Roy Alexander Weiss at the Manchester Royal Exchange and yeah. at Kwame Kweama at the Young Vic. What kind of impact do you think that that has on, on the theatre landscape today in contrast to where you were um, 40 years ago? Yeah, well, it's an extraordinary um, achievement, really. Um, and it, But again, it's only come in um, the last, what, five years? Yeah, that literally that, yeah. So, you know... Um, but that's why when uh, I left drama school, Patricia Hilaire and Bernadine Evaristo and myself set up Theatre of Black Women because we felt um, at that time we didn't want to work with these companies that weren't doing anything that said anything about us or was doing anything that we were remotely interested in or, you know. Yeah. So yeah. we created our own work. Um, yeah. So I think things are changing but we have to, again, keep the pressure on to make sure that it keeps going. Absolutely. And there have been spurts throughout the years. You know, there's been a lot of us that, um, uh, certainly in terms of black theatre, are what, you know, described as black theatre, because we were kind of on the outside of uh, conventional theatre, simply because they didn't include us and they didn't see us in the same way. Um, but also, politically, back in the 80s, there was a lot of funding and a lot of support for smaller um, theatre companies. So that's why a lot of companies like Temba, um, Carib, uh, oh gosh, um, uh, I can't think of them now. There were loads, <laughs> of, there were loads of us. And there's not that many now. And so, no. um, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because now we are getting writers um, working in just theatre, um, which is all we ever wanted, to just be part of that theatre world and to be recognised as that. So uh, things have changed. There have been improvements, but, you know, we've still got a way to go. 
We still do, of course, but it's because of pioneering women like yourself who've paved the way for these changes to happen, you know, and um, I can definitely say that I only was introduced to the world of theatre within the last five years myself, and that was because I did not see myself represented in the theatre that was available. Um, Fair enough, my introduction to that was quite limited to the adverts I would see on the tube and things like that, you know, posters on the sides of buses, but I never saw anything that spoke to me or to my experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's incredible in the last couple of years we've had such an overwhelming like quality of amazing black theatre like the barbershop chronicles we've had seven ways to kill kylie jenner juva nine nights misty if i i mean there's so many that yeah. i could reel off um have you gone to see any of those yourself what do you feel has been like the most influential or um, piece of black theatre in recent years oh god i can't see them uh i don't know i don't know um I can't think. Sorry. That's a big question for me to ask. And, and I admit as well, you don't want to you don't want to burn any bridges or upset anybody. <laughs> it's not even that. I'm used to upsetting people. Oh, not <laughs> intentionally sometimes. No, I just can't think of um uh which one would be the most influential. No. Or well, what about uh, your favourite? What have you enjoyed? Um what have I enjoyed? In the last what? Last year or so, I'll break it down for you. Let's get a t- smaller time frame. Okay, apart from things that I've done myself. <laughs> you can, I mean, you can say that. Well, listen, do you know what? Um, joking aside, um, I did a production of Dr. Faustus at the Globe in um, uh, uh, three years ago now, actually, and I made Dr. Faustus black and female. Right. And, you know, there, were, there was one of the old... Um, uh, ushers there you know the volunteers and um, he said to me I've seen Faustus so many times and I've never seen anything like this and so <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing it and I shall let you know how I feel about it and I said I'm sure you will <laughs> and uh, after he'd watched it he said to me Do you know I don't think I will ever see Faustus in the same way again this is wonderful that's this amazing is wonderful. But, yeah you know, yeah, that was great. It just felt um, right to do it. And Jocelyn G. Sien, who played Faustus, was phenomenal. I'm so gutted that I missed that. Uh, that I missed that production. There really is something so powerful in turning yeah. a, Brit- a classic piece of British yeah. on its head, right? And yeah. and letting it serve audiences that it was never made for. Right. Yeah. So thanks for that, Paula. I mean, is there? Can I? Can we? Can our audiences catch that anywhere? Do you know if it's no, online? No, no, no. I don't think it was um, filmed. Actually, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Um, but anyway, you know, that just means that uh, there'll be other stuff coming. And we'll we have just to have bring to it be, back. Do you know what? It would be wonderful because um, she was uh, phenomenal in it. Um, yeah. And it really made people think and it really made people, uh, the debates afterwards were fantastic, you know, because we did, for example, as well, we did the Seven Deadly Sins um, based on Candomblé. So the whole kind of uh, Brazilian, African kind of movement and sounds. So, yeah, the whole thing was kind of like, oh, this is really different, but it worked. Yeah. And that's the power of the arts, right? I mean, yeah. in in changing perception, and that's the, that's where it holds its power is being able to speak truth to an existence that you know yeah. is largely marginalised. Yeah, and that kind of brings me back actually to twenty four percent because um, unfortunately, I'm as you're well aware, there are no surviving copies. No, of your this was in a day you know when you kind of typed things. <laughs> before the internet before google yeah. drives and, and usb sticks yeah but i just think that's i mean how do you feel about the fact that it's lost because that's an atem- integral um you know a part of yeah, that think, theater history and of the female experience sure but i think it was also of a time you know where so much of um uh we weren't archiving stuff we were just doing stuff you know um 
so many other black theatres, all the ones that have gone now, all of those plays that were done, um, most of them would probably have gone the same way. And I think mm. the only thing we can do is say, damn, what a shame. Yeah. But just to make sure that that never happens again. Absolutely, of course. There was, um, um, oh, sorry, please go on. No, I was just going to say that, you know, Kwame at one time, I can't remember how many years ago now, was trying to archive, you know, all the black plays that had been done in Britain. Uh, through the National Theatre. So there are some that you could hear recordings of bits of them, but um, I don't know how far uh, that went on. I don't know, you know, what the final outcome was, but there is some stuff there. And people are now kind of starting to look for stuff because, you know, um, a lot of the actors... Um, it's funny, during lockdown, I've had so many phone calls from people saying, oh, God, I found this script the other day that I didn't even know I had. So, you know, 24% could be somewhere. I am really hoping that because we, yeah. I mean, our Heritage Archive team, I mean, we have to bear the shame of, of, of having lost that piece of yeah. theatre, um, which is essential to like our early history, you know. Um, but one of our staff members did suggest a, a Twitter campaign, which will be named Find Paulette's Play. <laughs> if you're on board. <laughs> Um, and we are dedicated to tracking it down and um, just to just to give it the respect it deserves. And I mean, there are so many black members of staff here at Theme Break who are absolutely gutted um, yeah. that, you know, we can't read that piece. And I think there's a lot to be said about um, the erasure of black experiences. And of course, this is something that yeah, you know, yeah. happened incidentally, but it kind of yes. is part of a recurring pattern of, yeah, um, sure. of black experiences being hidden. I'm um, not saying that, you know, this was done intentionally, but we don't, no, want, to we don't no. want to happen again. No, but as I said, in a kind of way, it's, um, if you look at it this way, it was kind of like, well, yeah, that was one, but there'll be others. So, you know, right? You just have to write us another one. I mean, <laughs> for Clean Break's 50th anniversary, hopefully <laughs> it will be 1%, um, yeah. hopefully within 10 years of change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, speaking of the like heritage project, um, you were interviewed earlier on this year um, with uh, Anne Mitchell, another long-time oh, yeah. late friend. Um, but this was obviously, you know, pre-pandemic, um, pre-Black Lives Matter, and um, before the murder of George Floyd. And I just wanted to know, like, where you felt we were now. Um, if you could, like, kind of speak a little bit about what is going on in the world and, and how you think it's impacted the arts? Um, well, I think the, the impact on the arts we don't know yet because we've had this lockdown. So it will be interesting to see once we start um, coming out the other side of this, what um, changes have happened. But one of the things that's happened is um, that certainly this year on television, I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems like certainly Channel 4 and ITV have really run with uh, Black History Month. Yeah. Now, my only um, uh, question is, uh, what happens in November? Yeah. You know, do we all yeah. kind of just suddenly disappear? Wow. Um, you know, I come from a generation that remembers when um, No Problem was first shown on television. They didn't even have adverts. What's and No it was Problem? On, no Problem was a sitcom right. and it was about a family that um, the parents had gone back to the Caribbean and the children, but of course they were old enough to have been left, were yeah. left alone and it was about their lives. And uh, and it was really, really funny. It sounds um, hilarious, actually. Yeah. I, can, I can imagine the hijinks. Yeah, and but as I said, when up. it went out, they, they didn't even have adverts that they would play in between the commercial break. He went to the test card. Why? So now, um, you know, uh, because they didn't, nobody wanted to be advertised in the oh, break wow. of this black show. Yeah, wow. but, and it still went out, but with no adverts in it. And now you kind of go, so I've seen progress, if you like, yeah. in that major way. But as I say, what happens next month? Of course. And yeah. this is the ongoing argument is black history is... Is, is interlinked with British history in but it's ways not, but that it is. We have to stop saying black history because it's just history. This is, yeah. You know, yeah, because that's why true. we're not included because they keep going, and it's not us. We've never said, really, we've got our own history and you've got yours. We've always said we are part of this, but we weren't invited in, we weren't accepted, we weren't yeah. encouraged to because it was a challenge to them. 
you know, how dare you say that, um, what, you're the same as me? Right. I mean, right. so yeah, that shakes the foundations that, you know, this country and the world was, was built on, yeah. was built on the subjugation of black people. And unfortunately, we are still experiencing yeah. the the consequences of that. But yeah, no, thank you for correcting me, because I think that is something you know, unconscious bias that even we as as, as black people yeah. are the education system and the way that we're taught about our history is separate to, yeah. to history as a whole, but actually yeah. it's world history and everybody has a part to play in that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there have been some um, incredible things on TV at the moment. I've been watching Enslaved, which I've had to just kind of take a break from for a little bit. Um, yeah. and, and lots of other programming, um, which is celebrating uh, blackness and black creation. But I've also been very pleased to see more black programs on television just generally. I mean, I watched I May Destroy You um, yeah. earlier on, which was an absolutely phenomenal piece of television by Michaela Cole, who is just yeah. an incredible artist. And I feel like there are some voices who are really bringing black experience to the mainstream um so yeah. hopefully come november next year you know we might see some improvement in that but i i i mean yeah i next month yeah you know, there's, there should be enough and if there isn't yeah. enough material to keep it going then um let's create them now so that there isn't we don't have to wait another year to be remembered we're here. And I, there always is enough material, that's the thing. I'm just of not... Of course. Uh, it's just oh, look, about, you know, all the, the old to listen. Argu- look, all the old arguments, you know, I remember we, um, years ago, there was a group of um, uh, young black men who called themselves a posse, and they wrote and performed all their own sketches, and they were hilarious. And we went to Channel 4, and, and we'd done it live, you know, at... Um, mainly Theatre or Stratford East, but we toured it as well. Mm. And uh, they, we went to Channel 4 with, with, the, with the guys saying, listen, we've got, um, you need a sketch show and a black one would be great. Mm. And uh, here you are. And they said, we don't think you can sustain it. And what are you talking about? We've sustained it for years in theatre. What do you mean we don't think we could? We've got a series already here to shoot and there's easily, yes. we could do, but just, you know, so that's why I kind of go, yeah, this is great. Well done, Channel 4. Well done, ITV. But let's make sure this is not just a flash in the pan. Absolutely. And I mean, that really speaks to a lack of understanding of black audience and the appetite and what we want to see. Um, and I don't, I mean, I, I recently um, started watching The Real McCoy, which I believe yeah. you produced on back in the 90s. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I feel like in the 90s, there kind of was this sweet period of, of black comedy, black sitcoms, shows like The French Prince of Ballet, um, My Wife and Kids, all these kinds of things. And that, that ha- kind of has petered off um, mm. over the last decade or so. I mean, do you have any, any opinion on why that is? Um, No, it's just, unfortunately, a cycle that keeps repeating itself, Mm -hmm. which is why I'm saying, you know, I'm celebrating that there's all this fabulous stuff, but let's make sure that it's not just once a year or once and then um, uh, we wait another 10 years. They used to have a policy. It was never written down anywhere, but, you know, certainly, absolutely at the BBC and therefore various other places that it was one in, one out. Wow. You know, so, Yeah. yeah. Gosh, well, I really hope that we make a change today. <laughs> I mean, yeah. going on from that then, I mean, especially for for uh, black people, um, why do you think the arts are vital? Um, what do you, wait, like, where do you think the arts sit in terms of social change? Well, if we go back to what we were saying earlier on, that actually we're talking about culture, um, So uh, a culture is crucial to any human race, human Mm. being. So um, that's why we have to have it. And that's why we have to have as much of a mixture of that as is humanly possible, because we're here right now. And that's the only way that we get richer. And I'm not just talking about black people. I'm talking about how we because we already know we influence. We know that that's a very strong thing that we've always had. Um, so it's not even about worrying about that. 
um, you know, I think it's just about being heard and being um, acknowledged, really. I mean, I worked on Desmond's, for example, another um, sitcom that was uh, out in the 80s, 90s, and um, which was a family show. And I, I remember once um, Channel 4 threw us a party because... Um, to congratulate us that we were the highest rating sitcom on Channel 4. And we had something like five point something million viewers. And at that time, there weren't five point something million black people in the country. But we always knew that it wasn't every black person switching on because we've all got taste, right? Yeah. And there are some things that you like and some things you don't. Clearly, we had quite a large white audience as well. And so it's about kind of not going that I'm... And I'm not saying that I was working on it to try and make sure that white people watched it and approved of what we were doing. It's nothing like that, because I already knew um, that if you do something of any excellence, everybody will want to try and watch it. So that's all it is. And the more you tell your truth, the more universal it becomes. You Absolutely. Know. So, yeah. So, you know, I think it's about um, that's happening now because... Um, uh, oh God, what's his name? Um, Steve McQueen yes. um, is about to launch, you know, this whole series of, uh, um, I think it's five at the moment, of different um, times throughout, you know, our history of being here. I'm really looking Which is great. Coming yeah, out, but, you yeah. know, it's great, but there's still more. There is still more. And of course, it's wonderful that someone like him would, of course, be given the opportunity to do that. You know, it's a bit like now you're talking about empowerment yeah. and that's how things change. So you've got an, uh, an Oscar winner who's doing that. You've got um, Idris, who's got his own company now, who yeah. is doing a sitcom, who's doing that, you know, um, young John Boyega has now got his own production company as well. So it's about when you get the, that change of power that's when things start to flow um, more easily. That's really interesting, actually. Um, I, I really, uh, of course, you know, it, it's about the gatekeepers and, and yeah. who allows what to be produced. I mean, throughout your career, then, did you ever feel like you're being a black British woman? Were you ever constrained by, by your identity in terms of what you create? Or were you only ever interested in creating work about being a black British woman? No, no. Um, I, you know, I wanted to do all sorts of things. You know, I trained as an actress and I haven't acted. Um, I started writing. I haven't written anything for a while. I got into directing and I thought, oh, this is it. I'm now directing theatre. I'm very, 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 very happy. Uh, and now I've got a career also in television directing. Yeah. So, you know, um, I've always been one of those people that I kind of fancy trying that, so I'll try it. Yeah. Um, and then you have to... Um, fight whatever battles come your way. But I've also been a firm believer in, um, uh, as nice as I am, I will still be very honest with people. I, you know, I don't have to scream and shout about things necessarily, but um, just the fact that you're brave enough to say it can sometimes devastate some of these people. So I'll give an example of what I mean. So I was asked to come in to do the second series of a sitcom on BBC called The Crouches. And it was written by um, a white Glaswegian man who wrote a thing called Rabsy Nesbitt, which was a, a sitcom set in Glasgow. Very, very funny. Yeah. Right? Crouches, I didn't find that funny. So when they <laughs> asked me, I didn't know. So when they asked me to come in and, you know, work on it, yeah. I said, well, there's going to have to be some changes because... Um, the writer hasn't got his finger on the pulse of who these people are. And he said to me, are you trying to tell me that white people can't write for black people? And I said, I didn't say that because um, I think that there are a couple that I could think of, but you're not one of them. <laughs> and what was the response to that? Well, then, you know, because I said, listen, um, he didn't. It, what happened in the end was I got three black writers to come in and write the series and he stepped away. Because when I, you know, you break it down and you go, look, I didn't understand everything about Radsey Nesbitt, but it was culturally specific. There yeah. was nothing in the Crouches that was culturally specific. Mm. So therefore, you are not the white person that, that can do this because you don't know anything about the culture. 
Right. And what gives you the right to write about a culture that you know nothing about? Because the BBC needed something black, but obviously they didn't want black folk doing it. <laughs> and they brought you in on the se- on series two. Oh, we changed it, you know. And, um, and, I, and the one thing that I did say to them, they said, would you make it more a family um, sitcom? And I went, yeah, but you've got to change the transmission time because this goes out at, you know, half 10, quarter to 11 or something. You're not going to get kids sitting up with their parents at that time. They didn't change it. They didn't change it. So, you know, a sitcom doesn't go out at quarter to 11 at night. No. It goes at 7.30, 8 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a very kind of half-assed to bring someone of colour well, onto the because, team in, yeah, season, yeah. in season two to put it on so late. It's kind of yeah, a tick box yeah. exercise, isn't it, really, Absolutely. rather than natural commitment to yeah. diversifying voices. Oh, absolutely, because if they really were committed, they'd have changed the transmission sign. Yeah. Um, you put it there, it kills it. So, yeah. Thank you. But, you know, you just have to keep going, though, and, um, and you have to keep challenging and you have to keep... Uh, finding ways of making sure that um, even if it's... I haven't worked at the BBC in comedy since. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would know well, you again or, or you decided that you weren't going to... Yeah, but other people them. have, so it's cool. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. So, I mean, you have had such a wealth of experience in the arts. Like you said, in television and theatre, you've produced. What advice do you have for young black people I mean actually scratch that I'm not going to say young because I think we can come into this career at any age but also if you just have someone starting out mid-career who you know isn't quite sure where they sit and um, within the arts industry or how to begin well it's um when I think back to when I started it's so different now I think um it's got to be about how you what is it that you want to say for me? What is it that you want to say? Mm-hmm. What is it that you want to change? Um, what is it that you want to embrace? It's looking at what you can actively do, what you bring to the table. Um, don't come to be fed. Come with some food to put on the table. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a very um, Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, I know. Bring some food. I love that. Yeah, but it's true. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not hiding my roots. <laughs> I would never do that. But it is Absolutely that thing, not. You know, just um, come come with an agenda of your own and, a, and a, a plan of your own and then see how it pans out. And also don't think that you can only do one thing. Mm, yeah. You know, go and discover because there might be something else within that um, world that actually you go, oh, that would be more interesting for me. Like the taste actually. of that food, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and I think that that's when we'll start to see more of a change behind the camera. Yeah. Because at the moment, it's really hard to find... Um, there are a few black directors mm. um, for TV, but um, in any other area, there's not that many, you know, in continuity, yeah. in um, cameras, in, you know, very few... Very few. And that's an ongoing issue because, you know, the saying is you can't be what you do not see and we just don't have the role models. Yeah, but you know what? But you know what? We didn't see an awful lot when we were coming up and Mm. it didn't make a difference. You kind of went, well, we've got to change that. Yeah. That's what we've got to change because I don't see it. So therefore, let's create it. Let's agitate and create. Let's agitate and create. I love that. Thank you so much, Paula. I feel like that is just the perfect thing for us to end the interview on, really. If you don't okay. see it, make it. Yes. Agitate and create, yes. guys. Yeah. Thanks so much, Paula, for speaking. You're so today. welcome. Honestly, it was lovely I'm... talking with you. Thank you. It was really lovely speaking to you as well. Um, Thanks, everybody, for watching this interview. I hope that you've learned something. I hope that you're just as inspired as I am by Paula. Yeah. Um, Check out Holby City and Hollyoaks. That will be her latest work. And if you want to find out any more about the work of Clean Break, then you can visit our website um, or come to some of our shows post-COVID. So thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye. I'm going to stop recording. Okay.